Hey everyone, welcome back. Um, we are on Leviticus 14, so we'll jump into that. Guster is sleeping soundly. Penny is on his chair over there. Uh, I have a new pair of reading glasses, yay! And I'm making a cup of decaf coffee. So grab your coffee or tea or whatever you enjoy. Okay, well, let's... Just... Oops, my coffee's done. Well, I'll wait. Um, okay, Leviticus 14, we'll just jump in. The Lord said to Moses, these are the regulations for any diseased person at the time of their ceremonial cleansing when they are brought to the priest. The priest is to go outside the camp and examine them. If they have been healed of their defiling skin disease, the priest shall order that two live, clean birds and some cedar wood, scarlet yarn, and hyssop be brought for the person to be cleansed. Then the priest shall order that one of the birds be killed over fresh water in a clay pot. He is then to take the live bird and dip it together with the cedar wood, the scarlet yarn, and the hyssop into the blood of the bird that was killed over the fresh water. Seven times he shall sprinkle the one to be cleansed of the defiling disease and then pronounce them clean. After that, he is to release the live bird in the open fields. The person to be cleansed must wash their clothes shave off all their hair, and bathe with water. Then they will be ceremonially clean. After this, they may come into the camp, but they must stay outside their tent for seven days. On the seventh day, they must shave off all their hair. They must shave their head, their beard, their eyebrows, and the rest of their hair. They must wash their clothes and bathe themselves with water, and they will be clean. On the eighth day, they must bring two, oops, sorry, hold on one second. That's me, not the Bible. That was my phone telling me I have to do something. Okay, take two. Here's verse 10 again. On the eighth day, they must bring two male lambs and one ewe lamb, a year old, each without defect, along with three tenths of an epah of the finest flour mixed with olive oil for a grain offering, and one log of oil. The priest who pronounces them clean shall present both the one to be cleansed and their offerings before the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Then the priest is to take one of the male lambs and offer it as a guilt offering along with the log of oil. He shall wave them before the Lord as a wave offering. He is to slaughter the lamb in the sanctuary area where the sin offering and the burnt offering are slaughtered. Like the sin offering, the guilt offering belongs to the priest. It is most holy. The priest is to take some of the blood of the guilt offering and put it on the lobe of the right ear of the one to be cleansed, on the thumb of their right hand, and on the big toe of their right foot. The priest shall then take some of the log of oil, pour it in the palm of his own left hand, dip his right forefinger into the oil in his palm, and with his finger sprinkle some of it before the Lord seven times. The priest is to put some of the oil remaining in his palm on the lobe of the right ear of the one to be cleansed, on the thumb of their right hand, and on the big toe of their right foot, on top of the blood of the guilt offering. The rest of the oil in his palm the priest shall put on the head of the one to be cleansed and make atonement for them before the Lord. Then the priest is to sacrifice the sin offering and make atonement for the one to be cleansed from their uncleanness. After that, the priest shall slaughter the burnt offering and offer it on the altar together with the grain offering and make atonement for them, and they will be clean. If, however, they are poor and cannot afford these, they must take one male lamb as a guilt offering to be waived to make atonement for them, together with a tenth of an epah of the finest flour mixed with olive oil for a grain offering, a log of oil, and two doves or two young pigeons. 
such as they can afford. One for a sin offering. Excuse me. Sorry, that's me, not the Bible. My phone is bugging me. Okay. Take three. Verse 22. And two doves or two young pigeons, such as they can afford. One for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. On the eighth day, they must bring them for their cleansing to the priest at the entrance to the tent of meeting before the Lord. The priest is to take the lamb for the guilt offering together with a log of oil and wave them before the Lord as a wave offering. He shall slaughter the lamb for the guilt offering and take some of its blood and put it on the lobe of the right ear of the one to be cleansed, on the thumb of their right hand and on the big toe of their right foot. The priest is to pour some of the oil into the palm of his own left hand and with his right forefinger sprinkle some of the oil from his palm seven times before the Lord. Some of the oil in his palm he is to put on the same places he put the blood of the guilt offering, on the lobe of the right ear of the one to be cleansed, on the thumb of the right hand, and on the big toe of the right foot. The rest of the oil in his palm the priest shall put on the head of the one to be cleansed to make atonement for them before the Lord. Then he shall sacrifice the doves or the young pigeons, such as the person can afford. One is a sin offering and the other is a burnt offering, together with the grain offering. In this way, the priest will make atonement before the Lord on behalf of the one to be cleansed. These are the regulations for anyone who has a defiling skin disease and who cannot afford the regular offerings for their cleansing. Okay, let's stop there. At verse 32 and let me write that down because I will forget hold on one second one second watch Esther while I write this down okay well there we go a lot of offerings and you know it's hard to read. I, mean, I mean it's just hard to read about the um, sacrifices and that um, system, the Levitical system in the uh, first covenant. I say first covenant because that's, you know, we're in the new covenant now. Testament, New Testament, Testament means covenant, and, you know, Old Testament, me Testament means covenant, so... We're in the new and I'm very grateful to be in the new covenant because I don't know how it would handle all that. Um, but I'd have to handle it because that was what you did. I like to imagine that the animals serve a really high calling, have a really high calling and a, a really uh, amazing purpose that, um, you know, they're types of, of, of Christ, actually, if you really think about it, these doves and pigeons and lambs, obviously the lamb, because Jesus identifies himself as the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. I mean, the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. So, you know, animals actually have a really high calling in God's redemptive plan. And so if I reframe that in that way, it helps me, actually. Because as we read through Leviticus, we have to recognize that the sacrifices, that the, the little innocent animals are types of, Christ, of Jesus, of the Messiah to come, who would be the ultimate offering. And that actually helps me. So then they actually have a very high calling, even though, you know, they they have unfortunate ends, you know. But in a way, no, because I believe God regathers his creatures back to himself when they die because he created them he loves them and they're innocent 
And so these little animals are, are you know, types of, are like sh a shadow of the substance yet to come, and that substance is Jesus. So they're just pointing to Jesus, all of them. So it's a very elevated status for the animal kingdom, if you, if you think about it in those terms. And just as Jesus died on the cross for the and and endured the shame of the cross for the joy set before him, the Bible says. So these little an innocent animals endured the shame of their of the of the sacrifice that the sacrifices for the joy set before them, because I'm sure God regathered them their little essences and spirits back to himself. Ooh, okay, well, that's how I like to think about things. <laughs> I, I hope I'm not, you know, kind of off my rocker. But Okay, let's turn now to Acts chapter, I think we might be in chapter 2. That's exciting, we're in a new book. And Acts is full of Acts. <laughs> okay, so let me turn there. Oh, I think we're, yeah, we are. Let me just double check to make sure we're done with Acts chapter 1. Yeah. So now we're on Acts chapter 2. Let me go there. Acts. Guster's snoring. I don't know if you can hear him. I'll put the microphone up to him, maybe. Hold on. <laughs> That's cute, isn't it? Okay, Acts chapter 2. Okay. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like a blowing of violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem. Oh, sorry. Take two. Let me reread that verse. I messed it up. Verse five. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven, when they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native languages, in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Um, maybe we should stop there, pick up where um, next time where Peter addresses the crowd. Yeah. But what I wanted to say is um, it's interesting... Well, first of all, that the suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Interesting how the Holy Spirit 
came as a as a as a violent wind from heaven a sound well actually it was a sound like the blowing of a violent wind so maybe there wasn't wind but it was like the sound of it interesting um reminds me when my mom died two years ago we had a green burial for her which was actually really beautiful and we had this little um service near the where she was being laid into the ground in the coffin and um it was actually a, just a beautiful beautiful day so sunny and, and no wind but after the service there was like this really strong rushing wind that blew through the trees and and then it stopped and i i thought to myself maybe that's a sign from the holy spirit that you know she's She's happy in heaven. Anyway, random thoughts. Okay, back to this text. Okay, so the people there, Parthians, Medes, and Elamites. Uh, the Elamites, Elam is a place in Persia, which we would now, uh, I think, identify as um, Iran. So they were there and Medes, I think, I think they might be Persians, or, you know, Iranians today, um, I could be a little off on that, but I don't think so, then you've got Asia, Asia, you've got people from Egypt, and parts of Libya, visitors from Rome, you've got Cretans, you know, kind of Grecian people, Arabs, and they were all amazed because they were speak the people were speaking in their languages but there were some who made fun of them well that's interesting the holy spirit the promised holy spirit is coming and, or arrived and it was the feast of pentecost which is a um let me look that the feast of what is that in Jewish tradition let me see if I can search that real quick um, just look at Custer while I'm searching oh I think it's just called feast of Pentecost the Jewish feast of Pentecost this is from um, Description, Observances, and History Britannica. It says the Jewish Feast of Pentecost, Shavuot, was primar primarily a thanksgiving for the first fruits of the wheat harvest, but it was later associated with a remembrance of the law given by God to Moses on Mount Sinai. Um, so, yeah, and then this is Wikipedia. Well, Shavuot, I hope I'm saying that correctly, is sometimes referred to as Pentecost in Koine Greek Greek um, due to its timing after Passover, Pentecost meaning fifty in Greek and Shavuot occur occurring fifty days after the first day of Pesach or Passover. It is not the same celebration as the Christian Pentecost, which comes fifty days after pa Pace Passover. What? Um, sorry, I'm like trying to get the right, hmm, here, let's see how we pronounce it, hold on, oh, Shavuot, oh, Shavuot, okay, I just played that, anyway, so yeah, um, it is a feast, it's a Jewish feast, 50 days after Passover. Okay, well, let's look at Custer. It's very comfortable. Custer? Custer! Oh, his tail. Custer! 
Esther, why is your tail standing? Hmm. Okay, well, let's say a prayer because now it's a, it's a lengthy video. I'm, by the way, I'm recording this on, what's today? Friday. And, you know, I'll post it for t Saturday evening. So if anything cataclysmic happens <laughs> between now and then, and this video is posted and I don't mention it, it's because I didn't know what happened. But let's pray nothing cataclysmic happens. Okay, let me just pray. Lord, we pray for um, just your Holy Spirit to fill us and live in us. And thank you for, thank you that I feel I'm feeling better and I don't have any weight. Oops, hold on. Sorry, I just messed up my iPad. Um, sorry, Guster, didn't mean to wake you. <laughs> okay, take three, Lord. Um, yeah, thank you that I that I feel better, and there's really no reason why I should be feeling better. But um, pray for just your Holy Spirit to continue to bear fruit in me. I pray. We thank you, Lord, that you offer us love, joy, peace all the wonderful things that your spirit has to offer that, like I've said before, we just can't buy. Even if I were a trillionaire, I'd never be able to afford it. <laughs> I can't buy that. But you gift it to us through your spirit. So I just pray for more of that, Lord. Um, strength. Pray for everybody who's listening that you bless them in a special way. And help your beautiful fruit to of, of your spirit to unfold within them as well and we pray for the peace of jerusalem and for the peace of israel as you call us to lord we pray lord um that you would curtail this anti-semitism that's rearing its ugly head which is demonic and we pray for the suffering people in gaza that you would comfort and reveal who you are in loving ways to them and for all suffering people in every country ukraine and every other country um what else do I want to pray for? Or I feel like I'm missing something. There's something on the tip of my tongue, but I can't think of what I want to pray. Um, oh, yeah, even though we know all this stuff is prophetic and you let us know all this would be happening beforehand, we still pray for, <laughs> still pray for things to, I don't know be good, I guess, <laughs> sooner than later. Okay, Lord. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. All right, everybody. Let's, let me put the microphone, although Guster's not snoring, so I won't put the microphone up to him. All right. See you tomorrow. Bye.